If you're interested in physics problems, the chances are you would have come across some variant of this problem before, where you have a pulley and a string or a rope draped over the top of the pulley with a mass connected up at either end. So that's what I've shown in this diagram here. And this thing comes up quite often um, in physics courses, but there are often a lot of assumptions that go into solving it, one of which is that there's no friction between the rope and the pulley. So what I'm going to do in this video is consider what happens if there is friction, and we're going to say there's a coefficient of friction equal to mu between the rope and the pulley. So I'm going to approach this in a very similar way to how I approach the frictionless case. Uh, first, just consider the forces. So I'm going to go through this quite quickly because I, I did the frictionless case in my previous video. So remember, uh, both masses have a weight, m1g downwards, m2g downwards, and they're also being pulled up by the tension in the rope. The difference between this and the frictionless case is that previously I wrote these tensions both as T, because if it's frictionless we can assume that the tensions are equal on both sides. However, if we have friction we can't make that assumption, and so I'm going to distinguish these two tensions by calling them T1 and T2, where these things are not equal. So firstly what I want to do is consider the case where M2 is sufficiently heavy that it's accelerating downwards, right? So Remember, in the frictionless case, even if there's just a really tiny difference between M1 and M2, as long as M2 is slightly heavier, then it's going to accelerate. However, if we have friction, of course that friction can oppose, um, oppose any imbalance to a certain extent, right? So the friction can increase up until some maximum value, which is parameterized by the coefficient of friction mu. It can keep increasing, and so there's, kind of, there's going to be like a threshold value at which it's going to actually start moving. We'll talk about that a bit later, but for now, let's just assume that M2 is accelerating downwards with some acceleration A, and because the string is inextensible, um, M1 is going to accelerate upwards with that same acceleration A. So let's apply Newton's second law, which I abbreviate as N2L. Apply that to particle 1. What do we get? So the mass times the acceleration is simply M1A. The resultant force is uh, we're looking at the force in the direction of the acceleration, so that's upwards. It's T1 minus M1G because they're in opposite directions. Um, and if we do the same thing for particle 2 or mass 2, we get mass times acceleration M2 is M2G minus T2. Okay, so the difficulty here is that we've now got two equations, but we've got three unknowns, which are A, the acceleration, and T1 and T2, whereas previously we could eliminate the tension because they were the same. So what we need is a third piece of information about these tensions. Now, the first thing I want to do is just rearrange uh, these two things, these two equations a bit, to make the tensions the subject. So the top one gives us T1 is equal to M1A plus M1G. The second equation gives us T2 uh, is M2G minus M2A. Okay, so maybe just for the sake of symmetry I'm going to rewrite this top one as M1G uh, plus M1A. Okay, now what we need is a third equation. We can actually get this from a result that I derived a couple of videos, videos ago, um, and we need an equation which is called the capstan equation. And this basically tells us if we have a rope wrapped around a cylinder and we pull on one end with a certain force, how hard do we have to pull on the other end in order to cause slippage to occur, to occur like in order to actually get the, the, the system to move. And what that told us let um, me just write the general form here. Um, capstan equation tells us that if we pull on one end of the rope with a force of P, uh, so all with a force of P0, let's say, the force that you need to apply on the other end in order to create a motion, uh, which we're going to call P, is actually P0 times e to the 2 pi n mu, where this n is the number of uh, turns, or the number of times the rope is wrapped around the cylinder. So you can have a look at one of my past videos, uh, the one on the capstan equation, to see where this actually comes from. It's quite an interesting derivation. Uh, for now, let's just use this. Um, and what we need to know here is this n is actually one half here. So n is a half because the rope is not completely wrapped around the cylinder. Right, well, it's not completely wrapped around the pulley. It's kind of uh, makes contact with the pulley at this point and this point, so it goes around exactly 
a half a turn. So n is a half. So if we apply this general equation to our specific case here, what we are going to find um, is that t2 is equal to t1 times e to the pi mu. Okay, just plugging in n is a half and thinking about the specific forces um, that we have here. Um, so there we go. We know t2 is the one that has to be bigger than t1 in the case when the mass m2 is accelerating downwards um, because then kind of the rope is moving around uh, like this. Okay. So now we're done with the kind of physics of this, right? We just got to solve our system of equations. So what we can do is take this definition here and um, plug in these two expressions for t1 and t2 if we want to find the acceleration. So t2, remember that was m2g um, minus m2a. That has to be equal to e to the pi or e to the yeah, pi mu times t1, which was. Uh, in fact, let's let's expand this whole thing. So e to the pi mu times m1g plus e to the pi mu times m1a. All right. Now, if we want to find the acceleration, we just have to rearrange the terms a bit and kind of regroup, refactorize. And what we're going to get, if we put all the g terms on one side, you'll find you get m2 minus m1e to the pi mu times g is equal to then we put all the a terms on the same side, we get m2 plus uh, m1e to the pi mu times the acceleration. And rearranging, very simply dividing by this factor here to get the acceleration, um, we find a is equal to m2 minus m1e to the pi mu over m2 plus m1e to the pi mu times the acceleration. Oh, sorry, times the acceleration due to gravity, right? And this might look familiar because it's, um, well, think about it this way. If you if you plug in mu is zero, right, the coefficient of friction is zero, in other words, there's no friction, you recover the same result that we got before for the frictionless case. So that's nice, everything's consistent. And to kind of interpret this equation, notice that what we've basically done is increased the effective mass of particle one by a factor of e to the pi mu. Okay, so the more friction you have, you can kind of think of it as being equivalent to making um, mass one heavier, which is gonna make it more difficult for the system to accelerate in this way, right? So we've derived the acceleration in the case when M2 is sufficiently massive to cause uh, downwards acceleration. By symmetry, you can see that if it's accelerating the other way, right, if it's accelerating <clears throat> such that M1 is going downwards while M2 is going upwards, you can just switch the twos and the ones around, right, because it's an entirely symmetrical system. Um, so we have made the assumption that M2 is the heavier one here. The next thing I want to think about is what actually is the condition um, for acceleration to occur, right? So the way we can do that is just, just by looking at this expression and see when this goes to zero, right? So we can say that um, basically to accelerate in such a way that particle one goes up, and particle two goes down, um, what you need is um, for m2 to be bigger than m1 e to the pi mu, okay? Um, and by symmetry, to accelerate the other way so that mass one goes down and mass two goes up, you need m1 to be bigger than um, m2 e to the pi mu, all right? Um, so to summarize this information, we can say, um, Basically, the system accelerates if either of these conditions is, is satisfied, right? Which we can write in terms of the mass ratio m2 over m1. We can say the system accelerates um, if m2 over m1 is bigger than e to the pi mu, or m2 over m1 is less than e to the minus pi mu, right? So the second equation comes from rearranging this second in inequality here. Or to put it another way, let me kind of phrase it in the opposite way because I think it's a bit, maybe a bit more intuitive or, or easy to understand. So I can say equivalently, um, there is no motion, so the system isn't gonna move at all um, 
if the mass ratio m2 over m1 is between these two values, right? So it's not small enough, it's not big enough, it's kind of in between these two limits. So there's no motion if e to the minus pi mu is less than m2 over m1, which is less than e to the pi mu. In fact, these inequalities should really be less than or equal to, right? Because if the mass ratio m2 over m1 is exactly equal to e to the pi mu or e to the minus pi mu, then what we would have is a case of limiting equilibrium, right? So that would be where the system is just on the point where it's about to move, but we haven't quite pushed it over the edge yet. Okay, so you can see that this contrasts with the case when we had no friction because when we have no friction, m2 over m1 would have to be exactly one in order to ensure no acceleration, right? Whereas here you can see there's this range, as long as m2 over m1 is close enough to one, it's between these two limits, then uh, no motion is gonna occur. You can also see that if you make mu bigger, so if you make um, the, the friction bigger, basically, then e to the pi mu gets bigger, e to the minus pi mu gets smaller, and so you expand this allowed range of mass ratios um, such that uh, no motion occurs. All right, so that's all in accordance with what we'd expect on physical grounds. So there you go. Um, this is not something I've seen discussed very often, so I hope this has been interesting, and see you again soon to look at some more uh, physics and maths problems.